Hello Haskellings and welcome to day two of the 2020 advent of code. This episode will be split into two parts. The first will be a bit of a retrospective of the day one solution and the second part will then be the day two solution. So the first part the, we'll start by actually having a look at the solution and then going through function by function to actually see exactly how it's working. This, this will be good for people who are a little bit new to the language who might uh, benefit from seeing exactly what's going on. Okay, so let's start with the interact function. So this interact function, it takes a function as its input. So in Haskell, functions are first-class citizens. So you can pass a function as an argument to another function. So that function is of type string to string. And what interact does is it will actually take the input from the standard input and send that to the function. And this can actually be completely interactive. That function can stream the input and output before it's finished actually receiving all the input. This is due to Haskell's lazy nature. However, the way we're using it for advent of code is to actually read in our input file. So the, our make file specifies that the stdin of our program gets the input file, and then the output of that string to string function will be sent to std out, which the make file treats as our function output our puzzle solution output. So interact will then do everything we need to be able to send our solution out. All right, so the dollar function here. This is a bit of an interesting function because it actually does nothing. If we look at the source code to dollar, all it does is takes a function and an argument and then applies that argument to that function. So why would we use the dollar function? Well, it does ordinary function application, but it has a low right associative binding precedence, which allows us to be able to remove parentheses. So for example, this function here, is the same as that function application there. So it means that whole right hand side of dollar is what's sent to interact. In other words, we could actually replace that dollar with parentheses around the whole right hand side. So the, the dollar actually saves us from putting excessive parentheses everywhere. Okay, so next, let's have a look at this lines function. So when we have lots of things connected by the, the dot function, we can analyze them from right to left. Okay, so lines takes a string and returns a list of strings. So what lines simply does is it actually breaks up a string into the lines of that string. How it does this is a little bit tricky because what if there's no carriage return at all? So lines will take an empty string and return an empty list. However, if there's a carriage return in that list, in the string, it will return as, as an empty string as a list. Uh, if there's any other string or a string followed by a carriage return, then it treats that as a single line. Well, the, the details are obviously not that, that important, but uh, at the end of the day, lines will split our string into its constituent lines, whether you have a trailing carriage return or not, as you can see in the examples here. Okay, so let's move on. So, well, we haven't actually yet covered this dot function, or operator if you like. So dot is also just a function. It's defined in the prelude, and it defines function composition. What that means is that it takes in two functions and returns us another function. So you can see that it takes 
as its first argument a function from b to c, as its second argument a function from a to b. So we're going to call these f and g, and then if we have a look at this closely, then if f is from b to c, and if g is from a to b, then if we're given an a, which we're going to call x, we can apply a to g. Remember that g takes an a to b. So when we apply a value of type a to the function g here, we're going to get back a value of type b. And f takes in a, a value of type b and returns us a c. So when we call f on a value of type b, we get ourselves a c, which is actually what we wanted. So that's how we return a function of type, of type a to c. We can actually combine functions in this way. We, we call it function composition. So lines will return us a list of strings because it has that type signature. And so this map read must take in a list of strings. Uh, having a look at map here, it is another quite interesting function. So map takes in a function from A to B, and it takes in a list of A's and returns a list of B's. So here A is string and B is int. So A and B here, like we saw before, these are called type variables. They stand for another type. And they're written using a lowercase letter, whereas real types, uh, concrete types, if you like, are written using uppercase letters. So if you look at this function definition of map, you'll see it just recursively goes through and applies f to each member of x, and then applies map to the rest of the list. So read then will be the function applying being applied to every member of the list returned from lines. Remember that lines returns us a list of strings and map applies this read function to every member of that list. So you take a string and return an A. But what is this A? So A, notice that this fat arrow syntax here, it means that A is a type variable, but it has the constraint that it has to be readable. So it has the constraint that it has to be a read A which is to say that it implements the read type class. Okay, so int actually implements the read type class, which means that we can actually read a string. And as long as we tell read what our output is, it knows how to give that to us. So this is why we also have to tell uh, GHC what the type of read is, because Read is polymorphic or generic, if you like. We'll, we'll discuss this a little bit more later, this whole uh, the polymorphism of Haskell. OK, so now that we have our list of integers, we apply f to it. f obviously uh, takes in that list of integers and gives us back an int. We then apply show to our int, and show similarly also has this funny constraint thing. So it says that as long as a implements the show type class, then we have this function show that can uh, convert that value into a string. Uh, the, the next part here, the plus plus backslash n, that, that simply adds a carriage return on the end. The next thing we should do is take a closer look at our function f. So f takes a list of integers and returns an integer. So when we take in a list of integers, we can actually use Haskell's pattern matching to split that into its head and tail. x will then be the head and x's will be the tail. What we're going to use then is a comparison so we're going to use the if-then-else clause, and it's going to see if 2020 minus x is an element of the x's list. So let's have a look at ln. Uh, we can see that ln takes an 
A and a T. And those have the constraints that T must be a foldable and A must be an eek. So foldable is actually just a, a fancy way of saying that it behaves a bit like a list, that we can actually traverse its elements. And eek just means that we have an equals operation. We can compare two values to see if they're equal. So we can use ln to see if an element a is in a list, a t of a's, so a list of a's essentially. And it'll return us back a true or false value to say whether that element is in the list or not. t of a here corresponds with list of int and a is an int. This funny back tick notation for ln means that we can treat ln as an operator like dot or dollar or plus plus. The main difference being that we can use infix notation, meaning that the parameters of that function are given on the left and right rather than after the function name. The first parameter of ln is 2020 minus x, which is the value we're looking for in the second parameter x's. This will return us a true or false and trigger one side or the other of the if then else expression. Note that in Haskell, if then and else is an expression, not a statement. So when the then clause is true, then we return back the int value x times 2020 minus x. Otherwise, we recursively fetch the value given by f of x's, which is looking in the rest of the list for a matching pair. Okay, so one thing we actually fail to do here is give a complete function, a total function. So what we have here is a partial function because we're not handling the case where the list given to us is empty. In, in the second part, you'll remember that we actually fixed this because we needed to uh, check to see if we uh, found the value or not. However, in this implementation, we have just a partial function, which is very bad form for Haskell. But in the uh, advent of code, it doesn't matter so much because we know that there's actually a solution. So we're just looking to find the solution quickly and we don't care as much about uh, have, having good Haskell practice. The next thing we're going to do before we move on to solving today's puzzle is to actually create a little library. Now it's very common for advent of code solvers to create their own libraries of functions that are useful for advent of code. This is because advent of code is a, a little bit special and we often want to use functions a little bit differently to usual. So we're going to actually create our own version of interact. So we have a module, we call it module AOC where, and we're going to import the prelude here, but we're going to import it qualified. This means that we actually have to specify prelude dot before using a function from prelude. So to start with, we're just going to say that interact is exactly the same as the prelude interact. So we're going to say interact equals prelude dot interact. Okay, so we can import this into our existing solutions. So instead of importing the prelude, we can import our library instead. This means we can replace prelude functions with our own, maybe better ones, uh, and yeah, maybe add some functions of our own. Uh, but we still need to actually then export the prelude from this module. And we can do this using this sort of strange syntax where we actually specify that the advent of code module exports the prelude and the module itself. Uh, what we then need to do is actually make sure that the prelude is imported unqualified, but we're going to hide the function that we're changing. This allows us to actually use our own interact function. And as you can see 
on the right, it recompiled fine and ran the code as expected. Okay, so what's our different interact function going to do? Uh, it's very likely that we're going to uh, have to add a code return and show the output of that function. So we're going to make our own version of interact which does exactly that. Next, we need to remove the show and append from our code, from our solutions. And I expect that should compile successfully and give us the same result, which it has. Before we move on to today's solution, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Overjoyed Banana, who forwarded a, a list comprehension solution. Uh, Red Tachyon also has a blog post uh, with the same solution. And I have to say that these are very elegant solutions. What I like the most is that they're the most efficient in terms of being able to read them and probably uh, to write as well. And often that's the most important form of efficiency in the real world. For a more runtime efficient version, this one by Grud X Machina is an excellent example because it only goes through the list once and uses an efficient structure to keep track of the remaining value left when removing each item. Let's crack on and start solving day two. I'm going to assume that you're, you've already had a look at the, the problem. And if you haven't, then I really do think it's a very good idea to have a go yourself at trying to solve before uh, actually watching someone else's solution. So we have these funny lines of input, which have a number range, a letter, and then a string. We then need to verify that the number of times the string contains the character is within that range. The first thing we're going to do is import our advent of code library. And we're also going to use this as an excuse to introduce parsers, and specifically the parsec library. And we're going to create a parser, and we use uh, this funny type signature for parsers. Uh, it starts with the parsec type constructor, and we give that a string, the what's called the unit. Uh, which is the left parentheses, right parentheses, and then our return type, which in this case is an int. We're going to use do syntax for this parser, and if you're not familiar with that, then don't worry about it too much for now. Just follow along. The parser I've written just now can read in many digits. So many one is what's called a parser combinator, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. It allows us to read in at least one digit character and it combines them to form a string. We can then in turn read that string and return that as an integer because that's our return type from the type signature. We're going to use our trusty interact function again. And this is the one that we wrote before. Uh, we're going to use lines with interact again to split our input into lines. And then we're going to parse each line with our parser p. And the parser returns an int, except actually what we get is an either int. And in this case, we're seeing that all the parsers were successful and they uh, brought back as the right part of that either. Uh, we're next going to parse the dash, which appears after that low integer on each line. And then once again, parse many digits, which will be then the high part of the range we can then return both the low and high values from the parser. Once we've done that, we should be able to crack on and parse the rest of this line quite easily. After the range, we have a single space followed by the character of interest. After that character, there's a colon and then the string So we parse the space and the dash actually as characters because it's slightly more efficient than using a string. Parsec provides us a parser called letter, and that just parses a single character, and that has to be 
an alphabetic character. So a letter from A to Z. We can also grab the string and that's preceded by a colon. We simply use many one on letter this time to grab the rest of the string because we know that it's all letters. Ah yes, we, it, there's actually a space after the colon, so in this case we actually have to use the string parser to parse that string. As you can see, we have a whole bunch of write values now containing the tuple, the, which is the int, int, char and string combination that we've decided to extract from each of our lines. We want to now remove that write. So what we're going to do is write a function called writes, which is going to extract the values out of those either types. We're not really interested in errors right now, so we're going to completely ignore any parsers that returned a left value. And, and left in this case it just signifies that the parser failed. So we're going to just assume that the parser worked, which is probably not a great assumption, but we're going to write this function with that assumption nonetheless. So this function just goes through the list and it checks to see if we have a write value, and if we do, we add it to the output of the list. And if we have a left value, then we just continue on. We recur until we have an empty list. So we're going to write our function f now. And f is going to map a test across all of our inputs. Test takes a single parameter, which is our tuple. And we're going to use that tuple to return a true-false value to say whether the test passed or not. And then after we map test across our x's, we're going to count the number of true values. So let's make a function to do that sort of counting. So what we're going to do is our function is going to count the number of values c found in the list s. We we'll use the prelude functions filter and length to firstly filter all the values that match c and then give us back the number of those values. Uh, count actually is also defined in the parsec library so we have to use a different name so let's call it count elements. Okay so that should give us back all of the items because we haven't written our test yet we're simply returning true. As it turns out, we have to use count again to count the number of times C is found in S and then compare it with the low and high values. So we're going to use a feature of the language called let syntax and this allows us to give a name to a certain expression which we can reuse later in the in clause. So this lets us define the name n to be the value returned by count c s. All we have to do then is check to see if n is between low and high. Once we've done that, the count within the f function is going to give us back the correct number of successful tests. Let's check that and we have our star. Now the second part is asking us to look at the positions of characters within the string and then if one and only one of those match the character given then we have a valid string. This will involve only rewriting our test function the rest of our code can remain the same. So we're going to continue using this let syntax to specify a p1 and a p2, which are the characters at the positions. So this double exclamation mark operation is one that should never really be used in real Haskell code because it's a partial function and it can cause our program to crash if the index is out of the bounds of the list, which can happen easily. One strange thing about Boolean algebra in Haskell is that there's actually no XOR function like you might expect. Instead we have to use the NOT equals function 
which is written as slash equals. This should give us our correct solution. And let's just check that. And we have our second gold star. Well, that's it for today. And I hope you enjoyed it. It was fun for me as well. And I'd really like to hear from you in the comments what you thought, or if you have any suggestions for improvements or other things that would make these videos more useful. Anyway, happy Haskelling and see you tomorrow.